my experience didn't match the vision that I had. It was way bigger than me. But a lot of the people that achieve great things, they never started with everything that they needed. They were never the person that they needed to be at the beginning. They had to grow into that person. And that's the uncomfortable part. Like, you know, you have that big vision and you think, oh, no, I'll just dumb it down because I'm not that person yet. I'll just do it a smaller version of that vision. You're going to have that bigger vision. But the beautiful thing is, is that it pulls you up and it makes you that better person and it makes you learn the skills that you need to learn and it makes you find the money like don't make the vision smaller you know grow into the vision hello and welcome i'm elizabeth formosa the founder of fashion equipped and devourer of all things fashion business and mindset in this podcast i'm speaking with thought leaders change makers and entrepreneurs about the business side of fashion and everything in between Fashion Business Mindset is your front row seat to real stories from designers, brands, entrepreneurs, makers and mentors. We'll discuss how to launch and grow a fashion business and give you insider access to the future of fashion. So let's do this together and ensure that you're equipped to make the fashion business your business. Welcome back to Fashion Business Mindset. My guest today is Kay Lang, the founder of Vixen and Fox. Today's conversation goes deeper than sharing a startup story. Today, Kay also openly shares her personal story of trauma and abuse with the intention of helping others. We'll be discussing some very sensitive and confronting experiences today. So if you feel you might find this content triggering, please head to vixenandfox.com.au to find out more before tuning in. Based on Australia's Gold Coast, Kay Lang is the founder and creative director of Vixen and Fox, the purpose-driven, fearlessly feminine lingerie label. Vixen and Fox emerged from the golden shores of Australia, fueled by Kay's vision to offer consciously crafted luxurious lingerie that's truly tailored for today's tenacious woman who knows her worth. Vixen and Fox is a space for those who wear, purchase and live with intention, meaningfully crafting a wardrobe that authentically aligns with their values. Each Vixen and Fox piece is a symbol of something greater, a community devoted to uplifting their fellow woman, a space to share stories and support each other through advocacy and authentic moments of connection. Vixen and Fox commit to using their platform to amplify the voices of those who have been silenced, to illuminate injustice and advocate for all of womankind, by partnering with organisations, including the Freedom Hub, Full Stop Australia, I Equal Change, the Australian Childhood Foundation, and Thread Together. A passionate advocate for freedom in all of its forms, Kay has built Vixen and Fox to be more than just a lingerie brand. It's a platform for positive change and authentic female empowerment. Kay has an insatiable desire for truth, for freedom, for substance and for more. This is a raw, real, vulnerable and inspiring episode. So let's dive in. Hey, welcome to the Fashion Business Mindset podcast. Hi, Elizabeth. Thanks for having me. Oh, you're welcome. I cannot wait to dive in today to all things Vixen and Fox. So, Kay, let's set the scene for our listeners. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your journey before launching your brand? Yeah, sure. So I grew up in Sydney. I went to a private school girl, a private girl school in Sydney and, and graduated, graduated there. And uh, after graduating, a lot of my, my school friends were going to Sydney Uni Um But yeah, I decided to kind of just stay in the workforce. I'd already been working pretty much since the age of 14. As soon as I could work, I did, you know, um, I, my first job was at 
the orthodontist that did my braces. So um, they had like a sign off and I thought, oh, I'll give it a go. And they actually hired me. So I ended up doing uh, like sterilizing their equipment, um, you know, doing the kind of plastering teeth models, um, you know. Um, so, yeah, it was a really great first experience. And I stayed there for two years. And after that, I... Uh, you know, I was really eager, but I still didn't know what I wanted to do. So I kind of went into hospitality as a lot of like young people do, um, went into hospitality and just kind of thought I'll just stay and do that until I kind of figure out what I wanted to do. So I landed a job as a cashier at the Meat and Wine Co at Darling Harbour in Sydney. Um, and, you know, I just thought it was going to be a casual job. I just thought I'd go there for a little bit and then kind of move on. And I was going to know exactly what I wanted to do by the time I was like 19. Um, that didn't, that wasn't the case. I ended up working with an amazing visionary, um, Bradley Michael, who is the owner of the Meat and Wine Co. He brought the concept out here from South Africa and um, it was just one restaurant at that time. So I was lucky enough at, you know, the age of 18 to really just watch an amazing visionary kind of build this empire, which, you know, is now over 40 locations and six different brands. I started with him in the early days. So, you know, he really gave me the autonomy to try different things. You know, he'd give me targets and, you know, I'd be like, can I try this? And he'd be like, yeah, all right, go for it. Like if it doesn't work, like that's okay. And not all leaders are like that. So I was really inspired by him. I ended up working my way up in the company over a three-year period. You know, by the time I was about 21, 20. I was lucky enough to be able to buy my first apartment. I had a brand new car, you know, I was kind of like ticking all the boxes. And so, yeah, I felt, I felt really set at that time in my life. So that was, that was up until I was about 20. So. And throughout that journey, uh, working with the Meat and Wine Co, was that where this uh, entrepreneurship, you know, um, I guess this aspiration and inspiration around entrepreneurship was sparked? Yeah, absolutely. I like I I was kind of different to my colleagues. Like everyone was just wanted to work and get really stuck in the nitty-gritty of like running a shift where I was like looking like high level. I wanted to like look what Bradley was doing and the concepts and how he'd set up a restaurant and how he'd bring in a team and like that always inspired me and I always gravitated to Bradley and mm. you know, always wanted to be around him he's just magnetic and you know he has people still working for him that worked you know 20 years ago that used to work with me so he's an amazing leader and I just wanted to be around that you know and he just he just taught me things that um yeah it's it's interesting because at that age you kind of just want to work and go home like just mm. make money and go home but I definitely did feel that kind of like fire inside of me growing being around somebody like that so yeah it was an incredible experience I ended up being with him for about 12 years on and off wow assisted in about 10 restaurant openings across maybe three different brands trained a lot of people from different countries they would come to Darling Harbour to train um, at that restaurant because it was like the golden goose of the group to be able to train at that age you know I think I developed a lot of skills that I took for granted at the time but now I look back and I realize it made me very efficient very process driven and structured so yeah yeah no no doubt there were many learnings from those days that you can now apply to your own brand so you were quite successful at a young age you had your own apartment your own car you were with this, you know, organization quite long term. You had some mentors around you. What happened next? So despite all of that, I was, you know, extremely driven and, you know, very ambitious, but I felt like emotionally I wasn't very stable. I, you know, I suffered from anxiety a lot and I look back now and I think I just normalized that because a lot of people around me were feeling that way. And it wasn't, um, yeah, it wasn't until now that I kind of look back and think that was just a really unhealthy way to live. And I was very like troubled, but on the outside, I was just, you know, I'm very resilient. So I would keep on just focusing on what I needed to focus on, ticking the boxes, you know, but ultimately, you know, I'd grown up in an environment where I wasn't, you know, I'd expressed myself, but it wasn't heard you know, and I did felt gaslighted by my own family in a way that, you know, and I look back and I kind of think they were, they're going through their own traumas and their own, their own journey. So at the time I was a young kid trying to express how I felt about certain things like addiction and addiction of alcohol, of prescription medication and things like that. And I was so, it was so evident to me from a young age that this was not how you, you're meant to live. 
but it was I'm not like my family's not the only one there's many families with these addictions in it that there's that kind of what we call the black sheep that wants to stick their head up and kind of like help the family but it also goes against the dynamics that's been there from generations before so I felt just kind of like fish out of water like had this family but yet I didn't feel like I fitted into my family so at that time you know I felt like I'd hit burnout by the time I was 20 I hit burnout so many times basically trying to fix people um trying to say like of course I can you know help you it's easy just like get over this thing but now I know I was I was very naive and thinking that um people can just get over their addictions and their traumas quickly so I um kind of ran away from my problems. I took an offer to go up to the Gold Coast and I thought, you know what, I'll go up there, start fresh. Uh, So I had an opportunity to go up there with a meat and wine co. And um, I was meant to open a restaurant in Brisbane. That didn't open. So I, I worked in one of the other restaurants for a while. And then when the Brisbane one didn't open, I kind of thought like, I'm just going to reevaluate my life and just see you know, what do I want to do? Hospitality was never the thing that I wanted to do. I was inspired by Bradley and I stayed because of Bradley Michael. But once we didn't open that restaurant and I was up here kind of by myself, I thought maybe I should get a bit more structured and study something and um, yeah, just kind of educate myself about what I want to do. So I decided to start a business degree at Bond University and I worked part-time as a waitress because after working as a manager in a restaurant you know that the waitresses make more money than you do in a good restaurant so I went to waitressing um, although it was um, soul destroying for somebody like me um, I tried to just make the best of it and realize that that's just what I had to do to study and a lot of people do that so I just sucked it up tried to make friends while I was there and you know get on with it Um, I was doing the business degree, but at the same time, I was like, I have obviously a deep need to help people and give back. And I thought, well, okay, I'm going to get this nice certificate at the end of it and put it on my wall. But what kind of business am I going to run? So I, um, I had the idea to take a course at Lifeline to become a telephone counselor. And that would mean that I would do 14 weeks of theory And then I would get on the phones and I would take calls from all types of people with different, you know, in different um, circumstances that were troubling them. So I thought from that experience, um, something might hit me and I might be like, oh, you know, I want to help children or I want to help women. So I, I started doing that and I was halfway through that. I was a one year into my degree. And I, yeah, everything kind of stopped in its tracks. I had something happen to me that kind of changed the trajectory of where I was headed. And um, that all occurred after going out um, one night in Broad Beach on the Gold Coast. Um, I was given two tickets to go to a um, a nightclub there from one of my managers. Um, and I was working and studying and doing Lifeline. So I didn't really have time to go out, but I thought I'm 24 years old, so I don't want to be a nana. <laughs> I was like, okay, you know what? I'll take the opportunity to go. So I ended up going with my housemates and um, it was at that club that I met a man and I instantly clicked with him. He was very charismatic and very, um, very driven and that's you know something obviously very attractive to an ambitious woman um you want to meet someone that's driven and so he he was coming here from Miami um in America and he was planning on opening some Latin Caribbean restaurants and he was yeah just like telling me about it um showing me photos of his trip to Jamaica and all the ingredients that he bought and and in my head I'm thinking like I'm trying not to get too excited but I'm like oh my God, like this, I mean, I was attracted to him, the business side of things, but I was like, slow down because I didn't want to go in head first, which I can tend to do. But I thought, let's just see where this goes. But this sounds like a great opportunity. Like this guy's talking to you saying that, you know, he's trying to recruit people here to kind of build these restaurant concepts, which seemed amazing. And um, I I love reggaeton music at the time and Latin Caribbean food. So I was just like, okay. But after that night, I went to Sydney. Um, I was like just visiting friend, friends and family. I came back. We kept in touch. I mean, he was texting me a lot and stuff. And I was like, okay, like he's super keen. But I was definitely putting on the brakes and um, still focusing on. I had a lot going on still. So I was thinking like, how am I going to make this work? 
obviously he knew a lot about me. He knew about like why I was on the Gold Coast. I'm a bit of an open book. So I was like, yeah, I'm here on the Gold Coast. Like I had these troubles with my family. I'm studying, da, 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 da. Like pretty much knew everything about me in a couple of weeks. We'd meet up for coffee and stuff like that. So um, I we ended up spending more time together and to talk about the business mainly. And then after a couple of months, naturally, it just started to get more romantic. We st- I started staying at his house more and like he was here by himself. So he didn't really have anything going on. So he'd be like, oh, stay with me or whatever. And naturally it just did evolve into that. And then it was just like over the next month or so that I started to notice things or the way that he would speak to me didn't align with how I wanted to be spoken to by a partner or a business partner, I'd ask him about something and he'd be like, don't ask me about that. And I'd be like, "Mm, okay. Hey, can I ask, how old were you at this age? At this stage, how old were you? 24. You turned 24. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So there's a lot, a lot has happened in between the the 21 year old and and achieving that success at a young age and really being on this path towards um, being so driven and ambitious. So I can, you're certainly taking us on a journey there and I can certainly see how this charisma, meeting someone like that um, and the charisma, the company you would have been in, it would have sat, would have looked like initially, you know, the perfect partnership for you to keep growing in your career, not only obviously, you know, in your personal life as well. Yeah, absolutely. Like, I guess I was vulnerable when I look back at it um, because I was just, I mean, it, I was wary, but at the same time I was like, wow, this this guy, I mean, he was from New York originally. Yeah. He had a presence that like I've never seen in Australia, you know, in Australian guys or mm. like no offense against Australian guys. It's just more yeah. of like, they just grow up differently there, you know? And I was just like, he had an edge. So I started to notice things that kind of weren't vibing with me. And I was like, mm. and then one day he came over to my house and he wanted to scan a marriage certificate that he had. And it was his name and someone else's name on it. And I was like, what? Like, and I asked him and he just blew it off. Like, don't even ask, don't ask me about it, you know? And eventually I got to the bottom of it and he would, he'd married someone to stay in the country. And I was like, well, first of all, that just goes really against my grain. And secondly, we're kind of meant to be in a romantic relationship. Who is this other girl? And I don't want to be in a love triangle. Thanks very much. So I flicked the switch in my brain and I was pretty much just like, not going to work. And, um, and that it was other things as well that I kind of saw around um, his place and that. So I was kind of starting to plan my exit and just distance myself from him. But we had got pretty entangled over two months talking a lot about the business and investing a lot of time into each other. So yeah, one of the last nights that I was at his place, I basically said to him, I don't think because I had started to spend more time away from him and he was like what's wrong and that and I was like look it's just not going to work and I was always very assertive with ex-partners I'd always say look this is not going to work because I know how I am and I don't want to stay with somebody and push my values aside I've done it before at that time I'd had a long-term relationship and I came out of it and I said I'm not going to I don't want to do that again so I was pretty quick to tell him that doesn't align with me and I don't want to do it And it was at that time he told me that he's invested too much time in me and that I'm not going anywhere. And I still didn't understand what he meant. I was still just kind of like almost laughing, like, okay, like, what are you talking about? And um, at that point, he told me that he's on the run. Um, He's wanted in Sydney for beating a girl almost to death and that he is actually a pimp. And that he wants me to work for him. And that was his plan all along. And that's when he showed me a photo on his phone of my grandmother's house um, in Sydney and basically said, like, he went hard at the beginning and was like, this is, you're going to be working for me. Like, I spent two months with you. Like, sometimes I spend a few days with a girl. Two months is too long. You've got to pay me back. And I was just like, this is this is crazy and then he basically tried to tell me that he's saving me that I was a waitress and that 
you know, I had a whole mortgage to pay for and he was going to save me basically from this crappy life that I was living. Can I ask what is running through your mind when this is playing out? You know, you're in a relationship with this man. You've obviously got feelings. You're, you're, you're with him. You're you know, on this growth kind of trajectory. And all of a sudden the switch is flipped and you're seeing this side of him. How do you even process that in the moment? Like, could you process it? What was running through your mind when he's actually sharing all of this with you that moment in time? It was just completely surreal. Like it went from being like in Australia, we don't really get confronted with these things, (laughs) you know? And when he was telling me that I couldn't almost like comprehend it. I was like, is this a joke? Like I can't understand it. And I couldn't, I mean, I did have that sense of like, I'm, I'm in shit. Like I've got myself into something bad. Yeah. But at the time, I didn't realize until shortly after we had that conversation that I told him I'm leaving that he physically assaulted me and I and then told me to go home with basically an undertone of like, you're not going, but go home. So yeah. it's like a psychological coercion that I can now relate to what some women go through, a lot of women go through in domestic violence and this whole victim blaming of why don't people just get up and walk away? because you fear for your life and in my circumstance I feared for my family and I I thought I could just go right now and leave and go to the police he had told me at that time that he knew people in the Australian Federal Police that he was a part of the Bloods um, New York Bloods um, gang and he had paraphernalia around the house and that was some of the things I started to see that I was like I didn't like I saw photos of him on his computer with guns and things like that, which I didn't raise with him. I just was like, I'm going to just go, you know, it wasn't like a normal conversation. Like, oh, I found a photo of your ex-girlfriend or something like that. It was like, you have photos with guns um, and knives and things and um, photos of girls in compromising positions and things like that. So I was like, um, I'm starting to see the picture now, but it was just too late to, to back out. You, you mentioned something just a few minutes ago, just in regards about to this happening in Australia. And I just wanted to mention that the first time that I heard your story and you shared your, your experience with me, that was the first thing that came to mind. It's like, you know, you hear a lot of stories about, you know, deception and trafficking and, and you know, the 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 dark side of life. But it seems to be that happens in other places, that happens in other countries. Mm. But this has happened, you know, right here in Australia. And I think for our listeners, you know, the reason that you are sharing this is because you want to you want to bring awareness to what can happen here in our country and how vulnerable um, we can be. And this is a big part of your brand ethos, and we're going to dive into that soon. But I think that was a real moment for me. I think, you know, not that I've lived a a very, you know, a super innocent life or, you know, been in the dark in terms of what happens in the world, but that really kind of hit me and and really um, I think it demonstrated how important it is for, you know, for you and for others to share their story when going through something that is so traumatic and not easy to share by any means. But just to bring awareness and also to to share with others how you have, you know, you've worked through this over a long period of time in terms of the healing journey and how others can do the same and where they can access support and tools um, Mm. and community as well. But what happens next, Kay? Take us through. Yeah, so basically he physically assaulted me. I then went home with just dread, just dread because... I just knew I didn't trust the police um, in the sense that you go to them and you say, I'm in this situation. They go and try and catch him. They don't catch him. And then what? Then something happens to my family. Like I think I've always thought like in school, I remember my friend, my friend and I, we never used to do like bad things because we'd always overthink it and be like, oh, but these are the consequences and that. So I was in that situation, like playing it out in my head, thinking, okay, I go to the police and then like they don't catch him and then they he kills my brother or so I, I couldn't live with myself. So I basically just was like, you got yourself into it, you'll get yourself out of it. And I ended up just doing what he asked me to do. 
which was basically, you know, he said he wanted me to be an escort, you know, that I didn't have to have sex with men, but, you know, that's not generally what men, you know, are wanting. So, yes, it did go down that that avenue and it was, um, yeah, soul-destroying, really. Um, it went against every grain in my body. I'd, I'd never stepped foot in a strip club or even given it the thought to to sell myself to pay my mortgage I worked so hard and I always will you know I always would always work hard to pay my bills and um, I was raised that way and so it went against every grain in my body and I couldn't believe I was in the situation to be honest I mean two weeks earlier I'd gone and rescued my friend from her house because she was getting beaten by her boyfriend And I actually got her to move in with me. I rocked up to the house. He was there. And I said, like, get your stuff. Let's go. And I was learning about the domestic violence um, cycle at Lifeline. So, you know, it wasn't just like I was just like, oh, like, let's give it a go. Like, let's see if I can make a little bit of money, you know, and let alone like make the money, but give it to this guy (laughs) who was then going to manage my money. It just was not who I was, you know, so that really... I mean, the shame and embarrassment, it's, you know, it's obviously hard to talk about the story because the first thing that comes to people's minds is like, oh, you may, I mean, even my own family, some of them thought I wanted to do it, you know, Um, obviously I didn't leave on good terms with my family. So they were kind of thinking like, oh, well, you know, you got yourself into some shit. That's pretty stupid. And I got victim blamed by people close to me. And anyway, but going back to the story I basically ended up being in that situation for about six months I traveled with him to Dubai eventually we ended up in Miami in America and that's where I started dancing there um, and in Texas as well so uh, something inside of me was telling me the whole time I was with him like it's gonna end you've just got to write it out there was something inside of me and I just stuck with that. And a lot of it's a blur. I do remember, you know, obviously the physical violence and the psychological abuse was like way worse, like telling me I'd stolen from him when I hadn't, accusing me of having like a lesbian relationship with my best friend because I talked to her on the phone. It was just another level that I've never experienced. And I saw, he started actually teaching me how to do it to other girls that he would recruit. And instead of um, coercing them myself, I ended up scaring them off because I just didn't want them in that situation. And a lot of them left. And um, every time they left, he said, that's all right, they can leave. But if you leave, I'll go to jail for your blood. And that's because I had the... You know, I, at first I thought I was stupid for getting into the situation, but then I realized he wanted to use my knowledge, my experience in restaurants, because he did want to open a restaurant. He wanted to launder money through the mm. restaurant, you know, so he was using my education. He was using my body because he was thinking, you know, oh, I'll make some good money off of you. And he just kind of had it all. The other girls he'd get, sometimes he'd bring them out from America. Sometimes they were Australian girls. I met Australian girls, I met um, New Zealand girls that he would literally pick up off the street. The day before we went to Dubai, he picked a girl up off the street in Surfers Paradise and literally she ended up coming. uh, It was maybe a week before actually because he kind of had to still work on her and get her to come. And a lot of the girls I spoke to had been sexually abused when they were younger and it's like he knew before even speaking to them, he could pick Mm -hmm. up on the vibe and he preyed on those type of women that's exactly what I was thinking he's a predator so he was finely tuned to you know that predatory yeah action I mean he obviously had mastered it over the journey so to me as I listen to you Kay it sounds like you were trapped you were you know in fear of your life but not only your life your family because he was threatening your family as well where is this man now what's happened to him So after I got back, well, I was in Miami and I had to come and renew my visa. He was trying desperately to get me a fake passport. Um, He had a a dodgy lawyer, which actually, this is the guy that lived a street away from my grandmother. I I later find out. It's just crazy. That got him his fake passport. So he ended up having a fake name. He wasn't 30. He was 36. He had a different name. So 
but he had birth certificates and everything. He had everything. So then um, he's trying to get me this fake passport. Um, I'm, of course, organizing it all. And I'm just basically saying, I can't get it. I've tried. I can't get it. I need to go back to Sydney to do my visa. And when I left for Sydney, eventually he agreed, um, but he was nervous, very nervous before I left Miami. And um, he kept saying, oh, you're not going to come back. And I was like, of course, I'm going to come back. I love you, you know, just playing the whole game. And in my head, I still didn't feel like I oh, got on the plane. I was gone. Like, I still didn't feel like that. I, I was still really scared. So I came to Sydney. I went through the whole process of getting a visa. And then my family found out. I think I was just a mess, really. Like, I was working a lot and just wasn't good, obviously. And so they found out. I actually told them that I wanted to do it. And that he was actually supporting me and protecting me. It was just the craziest story. And I just wanted to do that for it to be over. And I didn't want them to retaliate against him. So although we weren't on good terms, my family, of course, you know, I guess his family at the end of the day, they wanted to protect me. So they reached out to the AFP and they put a block on my passport and I couldn't leave the country. So I went back to go get my visa to just keep you know, keep him happy. I was, he's like, I don't care. Just go back and try again. So I had to wait like another three weeks in Melbourne, go back and get my visa. And they just put me out of my misery. They're like, can you just come to this room? And I went in there and two men were there and they said, uh, you know, this is a special agent so-and-so from the US and um, someone from the AFP. And they put a photo and they said, do you know this man? And I said, no. That's how scared I look back now and I think, why would I say that? You know, me with my clear mind now, I say, why would I say that? Mm -hmm. And um, it took them two hours to break me and say, like, basically, I think they asked me, so how many times has he assaulted you or raped you or something like that? And I, and I just broke down. Can I ask why? Why did it take two hours? What, what, that fear was obviously still there. You still felt trapped even at that point in time. So what was running through your mind when you're you're saying no, 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 and it took them two hours? Um, yeah, what was going through your mind at that stage? I, I mean, I was just in complete fear of the guy. I mean, mm. he'd held hot knives to my throat. He'd strangled me. I'd heard things from other girls that he'd done. And I just absolutely feared him. And he yeah. said that he had people in clubs, in the strip clubs in Sydney. He would tell me that you don't know who a client is. You don't know if it's my friend. I know yeah. people in the AFP. So I didn't know what to believe. And you kind of just feel trapped at that point. And then because of the period of time I was with him, he completely um, coerced me. My, my mind was just uh, weakened. You know, I was completely brainwashed into thinking, yeah and that I was I was trapped in this situation and I'm sitting there with two people that could potentially like end it but they couldn't end it because he was under a fake name living like across the world how are you going to find him so even at that point I was like this has to be done properly it can't just be me running to them saying please help me um I'd gone this long without doing that and I wasn't going to finish it by doing that so I I said to them look they said, look, he's a very dangerous person and we've been looking for him for like 10 years. He's been doing this for a long time since he was a teenager. Apparently his sister died when he was younger and then he just kind of like went down this like wrong path or something, mm -hmm. you know, and he, they was, they were like, you know, we need your help to, um, to catch him. And I, at that time, I was just like, I, I can't, like, I just, I, I can't physically, emotionally, like, psychologically deal with that, you know? Um, so they kind of like, let me go home. And, you know, it was kind of strange with my family, obviously, because people were still like in disbelief and like, oh, does she want to do it? Does she not? I think they knew I didn't, but the situation was just so big it's almost like you can't comprehend it so it's almost easier to victim blame yeah. it's almost easier just to say and you can't attack him so you attack the person that's there in front of you and you make you get angry at them for whatever they're upset about so I kind of started to try and get back to some normality it was very difficult um the first six months was just felt like freedom you know but after about six months the the PTSD just like hit me and now I understand why grown men that go to war can come back and commit suicide because it's 
whatever goes up must come down. That kind of feeling of going through a very traumatic situation, there's no um, dodging it. You can't come out of it and then just be like, I'm okay, you know, and just kind of try to go on. So I ended up going through a period of just feeling like completely lost and ashamed with myself. And I'd lost, you know, a lot of like, I felt like I'd lost years, you know, it was like a couple of years that I just didn't feel myself. But eventually I started to come back to myself and who I am at my core. And I was like, he's doing this to other women. Like, how can I possibly live with myself? You know, I have to, I have to help them. And so as soon as I said, yes, and I rang the AFP officer and I said, okay, like I'm ready to help now. They said, okay, fantastic. And within like a month or three weeks, they had, they flew out district attorneys from the US. They came, they took my testimony and they asked me if I could help get the other girls on board. But a lot of the girls didn't want to participate. I think I only ended up getting like two out of about like eight So I gave them all of that. And then they said, okay, look, leave it with us. We're going to start to build our case against him. And I think that was in like August. And they said, hopefully we'll have a Christmas present for you. And I was like, okay. So we kind of just left it. We we chatted a bit now and then like via email. And then I still remember where I was when they actually arrested him. I was working as a waitress. I got like a voice to text saying we got him. And I just remember that moment, like just feeling like dread. I actually didn't feel, I thought I'd feel relieved, but I just felt dread because I was like, it's like it started, it just begun. Like the journey that the next journey just begun, you know? So I then had to prepare to go to trial in Miami and I had to face him again. And I hadn't seen him for about two years. And I was just thinking like, if they don't get him really good with, with a lot of years, like you know, I was just so scared what was going to happen at the trial. I I knew that he was going to get charged, but I didn't know how many years he was going to get. So I flew to Miami and the day that I arrived, I ended up in hospital on a drip because I was just so sick, just so sick with stress and just worried. Um, You know, a lot of people at home were telling me I'm stupid to go. And, you know, why would you do that? Just leave it behind you. And, you know, and it's just not who I am. I just, I do the hard things. And, you know, so I went back, I testified against him. Um, I was the star witness because I had spent the most time with him. I mean, he wasn't, they weren't able to get a lot of the other girls, but I had um, a lot on him. Before I left Miami, I took his hard drive, like, um, you know, the little hard drives that you plug into the computer. And I mean, it was just full of pictures and documents and things that basically implicate him and charge him with a lot of things. So they ended up charging him. uh, There was like 40 charges. um, And, you know, I later found out that he was actually deported from America and that he came back in um, under a fake passport. So that was like part of the charges. And yeah, eventually, uh, I think a month later, he was sentenced to 27 years in prison. And that was when I was 27. So three years after I met him. Yeah. And then that's kind of uh, the, con- well, I thought was the conclusion of that, but, you know, didn't just go away after he was locked up, you know. No, but the weight of that sentence says it all, doesn't it? It's, you know, I'm sure when you sat back at that moment in time, that would have been difficult to process as well. Um, but it certainly would have been you know, a good, if, if there can be a good outcome, a, a good outcome at that time. But that really, that moment in time, there was a lot of healing that had to take place um, in the years that came beyond that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think I just kept, like, he was with a girl when um, he was arrested. He had had a baby with her. Like, I'm so grateful I didn't have a baby with him, but mm-hmm. yeah, I had a baby with him and he had broken her collarbone, like he'd beat her up pretty badly. And I I got to meet her like after the trial and everything. And so when I came back, I just kept thinking of that. I just kept thinking of her and that kid and all the other girls that he he was never going to stop, never going to stop, you know? So that did help me in my healing, but only to to a certain extent, because I mean, even I, I found it hard to digest the experience and I went through it, you know, and I just thought, how do I, 
how do I share this with people? Um, and since then, I have been trying to, I've, I've been trying to get myself to a place where I am able to share it with people. And, you know, and I guess that's how Vixen and Fox started because I needed a vehicle and a platform to be able to tell my story, to inspire others to, you know, realize that, I mean, it, do, it might not be the extent of getting trafficked, but, you know, it doesn't matter what it is, whatever makes you lose your freedom, makes you feel like you, you can't, yeah, you don't have that freedom. It always came back to that word for me. Like when you lose your freedom, whether it's in a domestic violence situation or yeah, you're at a job that you don't like even, like you just don't feel free. I think that's the most debilitating thing for people. Yeah. Well, let's dive into Vixen and Fox because it is part of your entire journey. Let's talk about why, why did you even, what what inspired you to start a business and then let's dive into your brand vision and the ethos and, and why you chose lingerie specifically. I knew I wanted to have a business. I was kind of all over the shop, you know, um, I want to do this, I want to do that, I want to have a smoothie bar or mm. I want to be a psychologist. So I I kind of had to go through a few things to get to the lingerie. And Vixen Fox actually started as a, like a athletics, like leggings brand. And then as I started to heal more, you know, what I do notice is as you start to heal, you kind of connect with that true, you know, intuition, you know, and things started to become clearer. And this vision of Vixen and Fox, the name, the colors, the the fact that lingerie was the product that was, you know, it was meant to be, it all started to become clearer for me. So it did come, I guess, in like a vision to me, the lingerie, but, you know, um, I guess other reasons why I chose lingerie is that, you know, it is a very feminine product and it's something that you use to connect with yourself. And, you know, during that time, obviously I didn't feel like I had very much feminine in me. It just kind of goes, you know. So I guess that helped me to, you know, crafting and creating these beautiful products, you know, did really help me to, that creative side is the feminine, you know. So it really helped me to connect with my feminine again and then obviously that will come through in the product and, you know, hopefully help women connect with their feminine too. Mm, Yeah, I absolutely love that. I love the empowerment side of of what you've created here. Talk to us about the pillars of the brand across, you know, the impact that you want to make. Obviously, you know, goes without saying that you have created some beautiful, beautiful pieces. You've got an amazing, um, you know, uh, process in place when it comes to design and product development and supply chain partners. But beyond the beautiful product, uh, what's what are the other impact pillars that you're really passionate about? It's been an evolution of the brand. Um, I've, you know, from the beginning, I always knew that I wanted to create a brand with a purpose. Obviously, my story is kind of um, what drove that. And I thought, you know, that was really at the forefront of my mind um, before kind of making money or, you know, and so it wasn't until I kind of met somebody along the way that kind of said, no, you need to start making money before you can help people type of thing. So that was really challenging for me. And I think that's something for new um, entrepreneurs to keep in mind, like it's okay to make money and you cannot help other people until you really do start to become financially free, you know? So yeah, don't feel guilty about that. That's something that I definitely had to tell myself. So um, as the brand was evolving, I realized I I was doing a lot of competitor analysis and I saw, you know, um, I guess a gap in the market for consciously crafted, you know, lingerie with very thoughtful, you know, intention and beautiful fabrics and that hasn't been like mass produced and that isn't discounted like every second month type of thing. We wanted to create pieces that you really um, take care of and you really they're an extension of you just like a lot of these like big luxury brands it's an extension of you so um and this brand is an extension of um myself and my partner who's who's also involved so it's an extension of us and the consciously crafted bit that's what has taken us time and that has been a long road and I can understand why people don't go down that road but that's the road that we took and we're really proud of it that we um that are we, we are creating a product that um that isn't mass produced and isn't just putting more stuff out into the world and then in terms of the other pillars obviously uh the awareness and advocacy around you know women's freedom and issues that kind of impede on a woman's freedom 
yes, sex trafficking is a thing and I, I would love to raise awareness about that. But I understand that not everyone goes through an extreme situation like that. And like I said, just because you don't go through that doesn't mean like what's happened to you is any, you know, less significant. It's just that you need to see how it's um, how it's affecting you, whatever circumstance that you may be in. So, you know, I definitely want to empower women to be able to lose the shame, you know, and just become like unapologetic about things that have happened to them that weren't even their fault, but it took a piece of them, you know? So yeah, through our advocacy and awareness and our collaboration with different organizations, um, you know, I guess that is my purpose. And that's, that's, I feel why Vixen and Fox, you know, is in my life is for me to be able to do that. Yeah. And then obviously building a community, um, of, you know, like-minded women and just sharing. It's something that um, I've always wanted. I've always wanted to connect more with women and just build each other up. So that's something I'm looking forward to. Yeah. Mm, absolutely love it. That's very, very inspiring. I can't wait to see that develop um, over the coming months and years. Uh, For our listeners, Kay, there are so many startups and emerging designers that tune in to our podcast, so I'm sure sure they'd love to hear what happens behind the scenes at Vixen and Fox. How does this beautiful product come to life? How have you assembled this team that you have across the world uh, to help you with these beautiful, you know, crafted pieces? Yes, so it's very challenging um, to uh, run the business uh, here from the Gold Coast when our team is in the uh, UK and Europe. Mm-hmm. That has definitely been a learning experience for me, but we've managed to do it. And, you know, through the power of the internet, we've been able to find amazing people um, with incredible skills. And I definitely have got the, the outlook that, you can do anything that you want to and you've just got to find the people to help you. So if you can't do something yourself, there are people out there. And yes, it does cost money. But something Bradley Michael taught me, the the founder of the restaurant that I was at, you know, you put the right people in the right places and you don't try and do everything yourself. That's if you want a, a scalable business. You know, you really need to um, do that. And that's what I started doing. Just person by person, I started understanding and with no lingerie background, with no retail experience. I didn't even know what a pattern maker was like, you know, so I was learning all these things as I went and feeling very stupid along the way, to be honest. Like if you're going to start a business, especially in an industry you don't know, like prepare to feel stupid for lack of a better word, prepare to feel that because you will, but just, just push through it and understand that it's, you're not going to speak to that person forever. And they might think you're a bit of a dummy or whatever, but you're going to feel that. And um, I started to just embrace it really. And I just thought, oh, imagine the story I'm going to tell one day when I actually finally like get through this. But yeah, so I started to build my team. Um, We found uh, a great pattern maker in the UK. She lives at the bottom of the UK. And then her partner in crime, they have, um, they work together. They work together on brands like Agent Provocator um, and some other big brands. Um, She's a designer and her name's Angela. She lives up in the North. And Alex is our pattern maker. She lives in the South and they're an amazing team. So they have a very good technical eye in terms of making lingerie that not only looks good, but obviously fits really well. So they're actually perfect for us because we do have a really strong focus around um, lingerie. That's not just something you put on and look pretty for an hour and you just like kind of want to rip it off. Although that is kind of the purpose sometimes, but (laughs) You just want to, you know, you're not kind of out like adjusting in that. We want it to be comfortable as well. So, yeah, so we do have um, those two team members and then we have our factory in Latvia and um, it's, you know, it can be, it's a, it's about a 12 month process to create a collection. And um, sometimes it's just, you know, it's a slow burn, you know, we've got a kind of Alejandro and I, my partner, we create the mood board initially, which is like an exciting part. We look on Pinterest or magazines or websites like WGSN for like trend forecasting. And we put together like a mood board and we start to like start to see it come to life, you know. And then we have a call with Angela, our designer in the UK, and she, and that can be like maybe a two or three hour call. And that's just working through the mood board talking about styles, seeing what's going to work. And um, it's at that time, I guess now I have more of an eye for 
things that aren't going to work. So we work with a lot of rigid fabrics. Well, our embroidery is rigid and you start to learn like what, what's going to sit well and what's not. So during that process, we start to really look at those things before we go to sampling stage. So yeah, that's pretty much our process. Once we've done the sketches, um, we then get proto samples made. And oh, well, before that, we start sourcing fabrics. So we start ordering fabrics from UK, from Europe. They send us swatches. Um, we test them. We wash them. We do all those type of things. And then we get some samples sent to our factory and we make this, the proto samples. Amazing. And your collection is absolutely stunning. So we want all of our listeners to go and take a look at your beautiful collections. What would you say is your point of difference, Kay? Looking at, you know, the lingerie market, it's a big market. Some might say it's saturated, but you found, you know, you kind of saw a gap um, in this in this category. What's your unique point of difference in addition to all of the amazing, you know, purpose-led um, initiatives that you have going on in the business? What would you say makes you different from other lingerie brands out there? Yeah, I I guess like not being lingerie, having a lingerie background, it's allowed us to come in with a different eye. We see things differently and I'm always trying to do things different and challenge the status quo. And I'm learning how to balance that because not all things are there to be changed. Like, you know, some things do work as they are. I'm very passionate about creating a brand with substance. Uh, I know there's a lot of lingerie brands that do have that already. Um, I guess... I want to be vulnerable enough to share my story within the brand. I want to, I want it to be a brand that women can be authentic. I think the authentic version of yourself is obviously the best and we don't get to experience it because of all these things that go on around us and what happened to us when we were kids and all these type of things. So I want Fixin and Fox to, to really stand for that. And our tagline is be unapologetic, be fearless, be you, you know, and through my my healing that came to me because I was like, that's what I want to be. I just want to be unapologetic. I'm sick of feeling sorry for things as women where we're sorry for things. Sorry, we can't help you. Sorry, I didn't answer your call, you know, and I started realizing we're saying sorry all the time when it's like, why do you need to be sorry? You know? So, and then being fearless, I was just sick of feeling fear. As I was going through my healing, I just felt like I need to I need to push through that fear and I want Vixen and Fox to be a symbol of that for, for women I want them to realize that when you start to rid yourself of that fear and that shame and stop being sorry for things you really start to step into your power and whatever it is that you want to do might not be a clothing brand but whatever it is that you're meant to do you're going to need to get to that authentic version of yourself to to show up in the best possible way so you know, I think our brands, I know our brand's going to have a lot of substance and it does already. It's just going to, it's gonna, just going to get better really. So yeah. Mm, very, very powerful. Absolutely love it. It's just, it's more than just the product. So Kay, if you were to sum it up, what are the biggest challenges and the biggest milestones you've experienced to date in um, bringing your brand to where it is now in 2023? Yeah, I guess Something that I really did struggle with, and I know this is very common, um, is imposter syndrome. I just felt, am I meant to do this? You know, is this meant for me? I mean, I don't even have a background in lingerie. I definitely just felt like a bit of a fraud. I feel like I've worked through that now. I feel like I'm starting to really own who I am and own what I've created. You know, it's almost like I was just discounting, oh, well, yeah, like whatever, you know, you're not, you're not making so many sales, so therefore you're not worthy of you know, acknowledging all the work that you've put in. So you've got to really stop sometimes. And whether it's like writing a list of the things that you have done, you've got to, you'll realize that there's a lot of things that you have done. And even if it's in your whole life, sometimes I did that exercise and so did my partner. And it really changes your mindset and you really start to realize because we get so used to beating ourselves up, like we're not good enough. I haven't got this. I haven't got that. But it is really looking at the other side of it and it's looking at like what have I done but if you're an ambitious person that can be challenging sometimes because you almost feel like nothing's good enough um and maybe that perfectionist side of you as well you know so yeah definitely feeling like 
uh, I don't know if this, like I'm meant to do this. I guess also like healing myself as well as starting a business was pretty intense. And, you know, the healing always happens. But what I've learned is that you don't always have to be in like a healing state of trying to fix yourself. And, you know, um, you go through spurts of it, like, you know, oh, okay, I'm sensing that coming up, you know, in this business. I mean, if you want to work through your insecurities, like start a business, because it'll definitely bring everything up. And, it's your challenge. It is a challenge to you to face it rather than complain about the person. You know, I've had challenges with my team and I could complain about it and be like, well, they shouldn't speak like that to me or they shouldn't behave like this. But you realize that you're the business owner and it stops with you. It starts and stops with you. So you do have to become very responsible and start to realize that you need to work through that. You need to work, you either get rid of the person or you learn how to work with them and learn how to manage them. Yeah, the healing part and running the business, I just felt very vulnerable. You know, there was just times where I just felt so vulnerable with my team, you know, vulnerable um, with people I spoke to. And yeah, I think it really held me back um, in maybe launching the brand sooner or, but I, look, I I always look back and say, oh, everything happened the way it was meant to. You know, I know we, we all, a lot of people say that and I feel like it really does. I feel like your business or your life will evolve at the pace that you're growing. You know, I have definitely witnessed that myself and I've noticed the level I'm at. And then I look at the people around me and I say, yeah, that kind of matches. And then five years later, you go, oh yeah, like now the people I'm around, that really matches my vibration, you know, and they say, you know, you attract, you attract, you attract that into your life. So if you're not getting what you want out of your business or your relationships, it does really start with you. And you've really got to look at your vibration and what you're putting out there. Because I, from my personal experience, I did really feel like when I started doing better and I started treating myself with more love, I started attracting people into my life that treated me better as well, you know, and better business opportunities. So yeah, I'll share one um, quote with you from Peter Crone, who's incredible. Um, he said that life gives you people, um, situations and circumstances to show you where you're not free. And, and that it's so true. So when you're doing, when you're going through your business, don't look at things coming into your life as, oh, such an inconvenience. Cause you can get in that if you're looking for the money and you're looking for a really quick, you know, quick buck you can start to get like inconvenienced by this like, you know, difficult staff member or this difficult supplier or something like that. But if that's irritating you, then you need to kind of look inside yourself. So that quote has always kind of stuck with me. I really, I, I like refer to that when I have kind of difficult circumstances come up. So I absolutely love that. There's so much that you've just mentioned that I can directly relate to on my own journey. Uh, the imposter syndrome, the growth, the growth, there's nothing like the growth that you achieve when you are running your own business. It's almost like you are just pushed forward on this trajectory that you just can't stop. Definitely, you know, being really nimble and also being pushed outside your comfort zone on an absolute, you know, consistent basis. Yeah. Um, but I think that quote you just shared is beautiful. It just kind of sums it up um, magnificently. Thank you for sharing that. Hey, where do you see yourself in the business in the next five years? Our pillars are definitely something for us to always refer back to now. And, you know, I feel like it's ingrained in me that I'll never lose sight of having an ethical brand, um, always trying to evolve our ethical practices. You know, there's definitely always room for improvement, um, but it's at the forefront of my mind. I never wanted to create a brand that was going to um, put people in harm's way, you know, not paying people correctly. I don't want to be part of the problem. I want to be part of the solution. We always want to just keep those pillars front and top of mind you know so we want to build this community of women and you know raise awareness where we're working with the freedom hub um, at the moment so we donate a portion of sales to the freedom hub they actually have a survivor school for um, trafficking victims um, and they have like a secret location like a school where they rehabilitate them so I connected with them shortly after my experience and um, you know I just love to do more I, I am an advocate for them I do help them with um, kind of reviewing things that that uh, around laws and, um, you know, universities send certain documents about the studies behind human trafficking. So occasionally I do um, contribute to those things. They It's a survivor-led panel, basically, and they want to hear from survivors. They don't want to kind of 
maybe speak to someone that's read it from a book they want to ask like someone that's been in the circumstance so that's really good and something very rewarding to be a part of um so yeah basically just creating a brand that you know inspires the next generation to use as a model really to realize it's not just all about money and fame and you know it's about creating something that's going to leave a legacy and 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 a positive impact in this world something that you can really be proud of Mm, I absolutely love it. A legacy. Who wouldn't want to leave a um a legacy? And there's no doubt that you're going to based on what you've achieved in a very short period of time. Hey, look, no doubt as your founder, as the founder of Vixen and Fox, and based on all of the other commitments that you have in life and in business, um, it's quite a dynamic role. What kind of support systems do you have around you that really help you with your mindset and your well-being? Because I know how important that is to you and no doubt how important it's been on your healing journey. How do you maintain that? And yeah, what um, what routines, practices, modalities are your go-tos? Going through the last however many years trying to like, you know, um, find myself again, basically. I tried a whole lot of modalities. Um, and six years ago, I met my partner, Alejandro. And I really do feel like my healing journey started when I met him. He's a very calming person to be around. And we just shared a lot of interest, you know, on the business side of things, but also um, on personal development. He's a personal trainer and a breathwork coach. And, you know, um, we just realized that we shared a lot of, had a lot of things in common. So, you know, over the last six years, we've really helped each other. You know, he's he's got his own journey and his own traumas. And, you know, we've really helped each other. So fitness um, is definitely something that I've realized that needs to be a part of my schedule every week. It's really important to to stay strong. I've I have suffered some with some lower back issues. I mean, sitting down a lot during COVID, you know, I, I do work full time as well. So kind of sitting all the time. So I've realized that, you know, strength training is really important for women, you know, not just running on a treadmill or doing Pilates, like that's great. But strength training is really important to build muscle around your glutes around I'm, we're going a bit off track here but I just wanted to throw this out there because it's something that I realized so is so important building your legs and your glutes and everything it's really important because we, we can tend to store emotions in our hips and um, you do get lower back issues and then you just think oh I'm just getting old and that's just how I'm going to be but it's not true you know you just might have weak muscles and here you are doing Pilates three times a week and wonder why you know, so it's really important. I do weight training three times a week and it doesn't have to be really heavy, but I do that. That helps with balancing hormones. It helps with anxiety. It helps you have a better sleep. So I do that. When I was going through that very intense time in my life, I realized I had to do like an audit, audit on my life really. So I, I kind of started auditing everything from what I put on my skin to what I was looking at on Instagram, what I was, you know, eating and I did it over a long period of time and you do feel, you know, like the playfulness of your life kind of goes away a bit because you're kind of auditing everything. But I'm now at a point where I know what's good for me and what's not, you know, and what foods, you know, make me feel like I've got energy and what doesn't. And, um, you know, I just, I just try and st stick with that really. And, you know, working full time, it is, it is demanding, but it does help me stick to a schedule and it helps me actually stay sharp. So, you know, I get up and I do my fitness and I have my schedule and just after burning out so many times in my life, like I just don't want to keep doing it. I, and I, you know, I know it's going to lead to other things if I continue to do it. So not being a martyr and kind of like always burning out and being like, oh, I'm so tired and letting yourself go, like look after yourself first and foremost and don't be, again, be unapologetic about it. And I know that's hard for women sometimes. We want to put everyone else first, but really like you really do need to look after your body and um, take the time off when you need it because you're not really any use to yourself or anyone or your business so you've got to be responsible in that in that and that's what I'm, I'm learning more so to not let it get to that point of burnout but to to kind of look after myself each day so yeah mm, such great advice and I love how you said you know that you'd done an audit so I'm I'm in the business of auditing businesses, really, you know, with all of my clients always diving into auditing the business. But something came to mind when you said about the audit. I've actually got an app on my phone now where you can scan a product. So it could be skincare, it could be food, 
and it tells you about all the nasties that could potentially be in that product and then it recommends a better version. Mm. So when you mentioned, you know, you think about what you're putting on your skin as well as everything else that we're consuming in our life from social media to foods and everything. But I think that that's also very empowering, isn't it? Because you can make those small changes, those small improvements in life and it all adds up to a pretty profound result. And then, of course, the fitness element and having Alejandro beside you who is a professional in that space so that you can come together and really support each other throughout that journey. So, yeah, some great insights for our listeners because I think, you know, every business owner out there needs, we need the tools, we need the support because it can become quite consuming and overwhelming at times being in business for yourself, especially for those who are still doing this solo and don't have particularly, you know, have a physical team around them. Um, it can sometimes be a lonely, you know, challenging journey. So having those, you know, practices that are consistent in our lives um, mm. really help, as you said, it helps to build that strength as well, probably mind, body and spirit, I would say. Yeah. Yeah. I I, I think the last thing I'll add there is something really um, important is that, you know, it really all comes back to nervous system health that is really does play a big part in how you feel and um, it's something that I'm studying now I'm actually um, studying to be an embodied um, embodied processing practitioner which simply just means that we're getting out of our head and into our body and something I mean through all the healing that I did I realized all these modalities are really helping you to calm your nervous system whether it's breath work meditation um, you know yoga because um, and that's something that I couldn't do as a child even up until three or four years ago I didn't know how to self-regulate and then you just say, oh, I'm, an, I'm an anxious person. My, my family were like that. So I'm just an anxious person, you know, but then you've got to start looking at the things that are stimulating your nervous system, you know, and I've become really good at self-regulating now um, to the point where I don't really experience anxiety. I get it when it's appropriate, but I don't just wake up with it and go to bed with it. Um, so it's, I've never, I never thought I would feel the way that I feel after living the life that I've lived. And I want to let people know that it is possible to learn how to self-regulate. It does take time and dedication, but you have to surround yourself with the right people and be consuming the right things. Otherwise it's very, it's very difficult. And if you want to start a business, you have to be in a place where your nervous system, you know how to self-regulate. Otherwise you'll have health problems. You'll be wealthy with health problems, you know? Yeah. And what's the point? I mean, what do they say? You know, you don't have health. You don't have wealth without health. You know, your health is number one. And um, that's the key that I, and I mean, even to the point I'm studying it now, because I would love to be able to teach maybe entrepreneurs, you know, or uh, women how to self-regulate and how to get back into their bodies and feel what's happening in their bodies. Cause we always try and think of it, think our way out of situations. So it's something that saved me and my partner being a breathwork coach. That's an incredible modality that will literally, you know, do incredible things in your body while you're doing the breath work. But yeah, it's good to just try what works for you and just find that thing. But if you do find yourself to be an anxious person and just remember like that's that's not who you are it's just it's just a survival instinct that you've maybe got stuck in from an early age and you've just carried it on throughout your life so you know it is possible to kind of close that they say like a trauma loop it's possible to close that loop but you've got to just find the right support network to be able to do that mm. for, for our listeners Kay for anyone who wants to dive into nervous system health where would they start like is there any are there any resources anyone that you follow that you think that our listeners could kind of start their journey to, to educate themselves in that space? Uh, yeah, I would I would recommend following um, Dr. Joe Dispenza. He's a quantum physicist, scientist. Um, he was really the person that got me started with all of this. Um, his book, Becoming Supernatural, is like my Bible. Um, it literally teaches you how your body works, um, the vibration of your body. I mean, he uses meditation. That's his modality. I used to do his meditations for a long period of time, one hour every morning. They're not 10 minute meditations. They're one hour meditations. And I've felt euphoria in my body that I've never felt before doing his meditations. But, you know, I find like I go through phases with different people. He's definitely been the one I've always gravitated back to, but now I'm doing a bit of breath work, you know, and um, now I'm learning about um, different um, modalities to get 
do, do, to do the embodied processing. So Dr. Joe Dispenza, Gabor Mateo, he's, um, he's incredible around um, trauma work as well. Uh, I'm just looking at my books. Um, the Body Keeps the Score, that's a really great book as well. Um, but yeah, breath work is definitely a modality that's starting to become more widely known and something that I've I've never had the... I've seen a few therapists over my time. I actually haven't seen a lot. I've done a lot of actually just self-reflection. I think self-awareness is really something that has helped me heal. Um, self-reflection, just constantly like um, refining, you know, the stories that you're telling yourself, the beliefs, like you have to become hyper. And I was always hyper vigilant growing up, but then I started using it for um, bettering myself rather than being hyper vigilant about that person or this I started being hyper vigilant on my beliefs and my thoughts Peter Crone Peter Crone's another um, incredible um, person that I followed as well but yeah there's there's a lot there's a lot out there I guess they're the ones that have really kind of left a mark on me um, but you know you, you you follow these people for a long period of time and I haven't really looked at any of their stuff for months now you know yeah so yeah don't that you'll go through these journeys of just like doing intense research like I was on Google like I'd wake up and I'd Google something because something come to mind and I'd try and find this and try and find that the important thing is is that you keep searching until you feel like you've kind of uncovered something and then you kind of work through it so just don't stop searching if one thing doesn't work try and have a look for something else but just never give up on yourself that you know that this is your you know, fate and that you're just going to be an anxious, depressed person or just have faith that you, you're you going to find you align with the right people at the right time. I really do believe that. But if you stop and you don't look anywhere, then maybe you, you're not going to find anybody, you know. Yeah. So. Yeah, totally agree. You've mentioned some amazing resources and bodies of work there. You know that I'm a fan of Dr. Joe Dispenza. Recently went to his one day um, event here in Melbourne and read all of his books and taken his online courses. There's so much information, but you can just start with his YouTube channel and start yeah. to get a feel for his work. But it has been transformational when it comes to my own grounding and nervous system and just switching my vibration. It is just, it's just definitely transformational is probably the only word that I can use to articulate it. But as you mentioned, there's so many um, amazing, you know, practitioners out there. And we're in a time right now where information is just readily available from the podcasts to the audio books to, you know, being able to reach out through yeah. social media to those that might resonate with us. So that's mm. just some great advice there, Kay. Thank you for sharing that. Now, Kay, based on everything that you've achieved and experienced so far in business, what key advice or words of wisdom do you have for anyone listening who's looking to launch a business? I guess the first thing that comes to mind is that you need to be passionate about it. You might start something and it might not work. That's okay. But if you're, if you're feeling like the passion's not there and you're kind of just doing it because you want to make money and go on a holiday, it's a roller coaster. And when you're kind of going down, it's that passion that's going to push you through. And I've, I've, had other business ideas that just didn't stick. This one, if if I, you know, I could probably write a book on what I've been through starting this business. And even I look back and think I'm crazy. <laughs> I'm just crazy. I don't know. The money that I've put in and the, the things that I've sacrificed, like my partner and I, we could have flown around the world a few times by now. And, you know, and, you know, we've sacrificed certain things. So, and I don't do it and think, oh, like, you know, I can't do I mean, I have sometimes, I have sometimes gone, I don't want to go on holiday. <laughs> but, you know, I, you realize what you, you're working towards, you know, and you have your big why. So definitely, um, and it's something that, you know, I've, I've done a life coaching course as well. And it's, they always talk about your why. And that's really important to establish before you start, you know, and making money is okay. That can be, that can be part of it, um, you know, but just have, maybe a deeper why, because if it's just the money, I mean, we all know, you know, that can only take you so far. It'll only leave you so fulfilled. So, um, so that's one thing. And I guess I'll leave you with another Peter Crone quote, quote that I always refer to. He says, nothing is good or bad. It's just, um, it, it just is. So that's something that I always think of because in business, as you're building your business, you kind of think, oh, this conversation with this person was bad or this situation that happened was bad and this one's good. And we do it in our personal life as well. And it's just something that um, if you can kind of keep that in, in the back of your mind while you're going through these situations is that 
you know, I think we've all had those situations where you look back and you say, oh, that was the best thing that happened to me. But at the time you felt like it was like the worst thing. So definitely something to keep in mind when you're, when you're starting a business that just try and not label things a good or bad, or, you know, just look at it as this is my journey. And this is the situation that's been put in front of me at that time. So perspective is everything. A lot of entrepreneurs talk about perspective and that's definitely something that's helped me is if you're getting stuck and you're feeling down, just change your perspective about the situation and, you know, just get into that boss mode and just, <laughs> just and just realize that you're the, you're the head of it, you know, and that you've got to, if you don't, if you don't have the skills, find someone that you can work with, like a business coach. So. Yes, absolutely. And you said, Again, you've mentioned so many things there that really resonated with me. Your why, I mean, you know, it's kind of the first thing that we start to talk to our clients about is what what is your why? Yes, you want this to be an amazing, successful business, but at the heart of it, what is your why? Because as you're going through, you know, those ups and downs, as you rightly mentioned, this is not just going to be smooth sailing. Um, we've got to come back. We've got to come back to our grounding. And why did we start this in the first place? Why are we so passionate about this? What is our purpose? And that tends to, you know, really help us to get through those difficult times and motivate us to keep growing and keep stretching ourselves as well. But I also agree, you know, there has to be the profitability there because, you know, one of the biggest passion killers in business is working extremely hard for little or no return. And it's just not sustainable mm -hmm. if, you know, especially for a purpose led business such as yours that wants to do all of these amazing things and has, you know, the potential to help thousands if not tens of thousands of um, others along the way mm -hmm. then we need we need to be profitable we need that cash flow in our business so there's absolutely nothing wrong with making money um, but it's having that beautiful fusion between the why and the purpose and and you know the profitability in business as well mm -hmm. so Kay just to finish up is there another key message that you would like to share with any other brands out there when it comes to thought leadership and making a positive social impact? Um, I would say don't be scared to take the road less travelled. Um, it's going to feel lonely and you're going to want to gravitate back to what everyone else is doing. Um, I can't, I've lost count how many times people have told me, like, why don't, like, like a lot of people have been look, watching my journey and it's been going on for years and they just think, why don't you just make out of China? Like, you can go to China, you can open a catalog, choose choose styles that are already pre-done, put your tag on it and start selling it, you know? And I'd almost get like annoyed. <laughs> I'd almost just be like, oh, like, I hope you're not recommending this to people. I'm not saying that, you know, there's a place for people that make in China. Like, I don't want to judge that, but it's just not my thing because you want to put your mark on the world, your authentic mark. So when you're about to create something, it needs to be an extension of you. So you need to always have that integrity in mind. And, you know, if you're taking shortcuts, thinking like, okay, yeah, but I can't invest in this because that's right, but it goes against your values, it's not going to be good for your soul. <laughs> you know, you're going to feel that. And if that's the foundation that you're building your business on, then you might end up going in that direction because you, you, you made one kind of, you know, sacrifice and you're like, oh, we'll just do it that once. And then the next time I'll just do it that once. And then you kind of start working with maybe dodgy people and you start going down the wrong track. And before you know it, your brand doesn't align with your values. You look back and think like, this is not me. I don't want to do this. So I have made, you know, I made a promise from the beginning that we would just stay true to our values and we have, and here we are, it's, you know, we've just about to launch our, launch our third collection and it's been a lot of, a lot of years, but, you know, at least I can stand here and say, okay, I've spent a lot of money and felt like a bit stupid along the way, but at least I'm proud of what I have right now. So, um, yeah, take those take those big risks if you really have that intuition and that vision of what you want and just don't feel like it's just too big to achieve. Just understand that like at that time, my bank account, my knowledge, my experience didn't match the vision that I had. It was way bigger than me. But a lot of the people that achieve great things, they never started with everything that they needed. They never be, they they were never the person that they needed to be at the beginning. They had to grow into that person. And that's the uncomfortable part. Like, you know, you have that big vision and you think, oh no, I'll just dumb it down because I'm not that person yet. I'll just do it a smaller version of that vision. 
you're going to have that bigger vision. But the beautiful thing is, is that it pulls you up and it makes you that better person and it makes you learn the skills that you need to learn and it makes you find the money. Like don't make the vision smaller, you know, grow into the vision. So, you know, that's definitely something that's, it's hard, but, you know, um, it's rewarding and that's what will put out the brands in the world that, you know, that uh, are going to make a beautiful impact, you know, and leave a great legacy. Hey, thank you for sharing so openly, generously and inspiring us all today. Look, I know this wasn't easy for you. However, it's absolutely in line with your higher purpose, which as we know is to create not only beautiful lingerie, but to become an advocate for those out there who are experiencing any abuse or trauma in their life. Um, and for them to know that they're not alone. This truly is a purpose-driven business that you've created. Now, Kay, where can our listeners find you? So uh, you can follow us on Instagram at underscore Vixen and Fox. Um, you can also visit our website, www.vixenandfox.com.au. Um, we're having a, um, a beautiful brand elevation. Um, it's in progress at the moment. So there's a lot of exciting things coming. We're getting a bit of a website um, revamp um, and some just really exciting things coming around the initiatives that we want to do and the community that we want to build. So yeah, um, give us a follow and um, you can kind of keep up to, up to date with what we've got planned. So yeah, thank you. Amazing. And let's share Alejandro's business as well. For those who are interested in breath work, where, the, where can they find him? Yeah. So his business is called Body Mind Lab. So um, you can find him on Instagram, Body Mind Lab Australia. And uh, he does online breath work or in person breath work. So yeah, thank you. Thank you, Kay. It is an absolute privilege to be working with you and to have had you on the podcast today. Cannot wait to see what you do with this amazing business in the future and uh, we'll be here to support you all the way. Thank you. Thanks so much, Elizabeth. Thank you so much for listening to the Fashion Business Mindset Podcast. We'd love to keep connected. You can find us on Instagram and Facebook at Fashion Equipped. And if you'd like to find out more about our Start Your Fashion Business program and your mentor collective, head to our website, fashionequipped.com.au. If you've enjoyed this episode, please share this podcast with others. Hit subscribe, leave us a rating and review. Let's do this together. Let's make the fashion business your business. This is a Guide Your Light Network production, creating podcasts with purpose.